Good morning. We appear to be on Facebook Live. My name is Alan Clues. Uh, welcome to the online Gurdjieff group. Um, I'm going to change things up slightly today. Uh, in previous meetings, I've been focusing on single topics. And today, I'm just going to go through a whole series of quotes and uh, just talk about the individual quotes. And hopefully, I'll stop at the end of the quotes. And if you two gentlemen have any questions, um, it would be great at that point. I'm not going to try and rush through a topic and try to get through it and then have questions at the last little bit like I've been doing for the last few months. Take it at a more leisurely pace. So welcome those of you who are watching on Facebook, uh, those of you who are watching later on YouTube, also welcome. Brian, um, how are you doing? How are things in Scottsdale, Arizona? You had an observation you wanted to make? Yes, yeah. um, I would pretty much consider myself um, vegetarian, okay. uh, but occasionally I'll, I'll eat you know, um, meat, cheese, um, and uh, last night I actually went out and I had, um, I had pizza with, um, it had you know, a lot of sausage and pepperoni, and just it wasn't normal to um, my okay. diet, and last night I... I felt it, and I couldn't. I couldn't sleep like I normally did. Um, I wasn't feeling well, um, and my stomach was a lot of noises. And I was like listening to the stomach, almost like it was telling me, like that this wasn't good, you know, or it wasn't used to um, you know, what I had fed it. And then the more I listened to the noises, the more it sounded like it was actually some type of communication, like okay. The, the groaning and then like the um, there's a different sounds and it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought about the um, the Gertrude quote where he says, uh, "Treat your illness as your teacher and not something to be hated." Yeah. And, I, and then I just thought that was very interesting. And another thing that kind of relates to that is um, in just in general fight training, you know, a lot of times you take some hits. And you'll take a hard kick to the knee, or um, last week particularly, um, I got a cranked choke. Hurt my my back was really sore for a few days. Um, okay. Um, with, with that, I would I would feel I would try to just like study the discomfort, and you kind of feel where it's um, where it's swollen, where there's inflammation, or where it's stiff. But I actually went online, and I was. Looking at all the muscles in this the neck, and I was trying to relate to see which ones really um, were affected. And I actually I learned some stuff about just the whole system and all the neck muscles. There. Okay, so, um, just give me one second. Um, I'm not plugged into my Ethernet. It's going to take me five seconds. Um, Uh, you you were breaking up slightly there, Brian. I don't know if it was my connection on this end, but I'm now connected to the Ethernet. But we got most of that. Um, so do you think your body is dishabituating, so to speak, to eating meat? Um, That's what it seemed like. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, for my myself uh lent started last wednesday and uh in uh, beelzebub tales uh in a ble an oblique way mr gurdjieff recommends that we go vegan for lent um so i've got soy milk in my coffee and i'm a vegetarian but uh it's just a good thing to do at this time of year but so um what you're talking about bears more experimentation um, to try to be the vegetarian for a little while and then to go out and order uh, another meal with sausage and whatever. Um, I mean, what is the purpose of your cutting back on meat? Is there any purpose? Um, I've been doing it for a while. Like, the main purpose would just be, I just find it out. And then I felt myself feeling better about it. Okay. And then um, I just kind of stuck with it. But it wasn't for any 
you know, particular reasons. Like, you know what, it, it's kind of trending now. And I said, let's give this a try. Okay. Uh, and then I started feeling good. And I, you know, I'm not, not hardcore with it, but, you know, I try to stay with it. Um, I've been stay with it for probably six months to a year. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm trying to determine the, you know, the nature of your purpose, what your intent was. And it sounds like your intent is, um, it's in the air. People are doing it. They're talking about the health benefits. They're talking about how it makes them feel better. And yeah. so you're interested in trying it out for those reasons. Um, yep. Okay, uh, you know, experiment. Um, you know, I became a vegetarian in 1983. Um, the very first summer I was involved in the Gurdjieff teachings, I knew I had to stop eating meat. For me, it was a moral issue. Um, and it's always been a moral issue for me, but I don't care if people eat meat. My son eats meat. Um, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. For me, it's for a very specific reason. Um, for you, it's not. So you can play around with it more. Um, you also have the, the, the fortunate thing, you can go home for Thanksgiving and you don't necessarily have to disrupt everyone's plans. You can just go home, have the meal, you know, maybe a Christmas meal, keep away from it the rest of the year, if your reason is doing it for, for health concerns, for your body, so that your body works better. Yeah, and just one of my I feel the moral aspect of it creeping in, like the longer I stuck with it. You know, and I can I you look at first, but now it is. Can can you explain that again a little bit more detail? What what do you mean by that? Just that the fact I even even if I didn't feel the same, you know, if you don't need the meat to live, you if everyone went that way, it would save a lot of suffering. Yeah. And you're, you're eliminating suffering by not doing it. If it doesn't affect you negatively, then why not do it? Yeah. Um, but what do you mean by it would eliminate a lot of suffering? Um, As for like, you know, the, um, I was thinking like the factory farms. Okay. And the way that that meat is raised, yeah. there's a lot of suffering goes on there. Well, as I understood it, um, this is going back quite a few months. Maybe my memory's not correct, but you eat more organic, don't you? Yeah, very much. Um, so you know, uh, if you want to eliminate the suffering for me, uh, you know, go with the, you know, hand raised kind of meat rather than the factory farm meat. You have to pay a bit more, but um, if that's your concern, I mean, we all suffer. We all have to die. We're all going to experience excruciating pain. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff made it very clear that we are all on a farm and we're all livestock, including us humans. Um, we are feeding machines, and through feeding, we um, transform substances within us, and substances are energies, and so through this whole process of digestion, of eating, of developing our body, of whatever, it's all part and parcel of this planet. Everything on this planet is at least all life forms are involved in feeding. And when you feed, you are fed upon as well. So even now we're flaking off skin cells and feeding dust mites. And, you know, we're going to the toilet and our excrement is, is feeding other animals. But at a certain point, even our body, hopefully, we're not going to be, you know, cryonically sealed in a chamber that preserves us, but allows the natural process of decay to happen. We're going to become food. And, you know, I eat so I can be eaten. Um, it was a very ancient phrase that Mr. Gurdjieff talked about. And so we are food. We become food. Um, we will be eaten. We do eat. Uh, it really depends on... Um, where your priorities are. Um, if your priority is to reduce suffering, um, then just buy your meat from those certified places, you know, sort of like the family type farms where they do it the old fashioned way. And um, rather than crowding them into abattoirs and slaughterhouses and doing it that way, um, there are healthier, more sustainable uh, ways to deal with it. Um, I'm a vegetarian because uh, I had moral concerns about it. 
And it's not just in terms of the suffering to animals, it's the environment, it's all sorts of stuff. But, you know, when you think of our ancestors living in small villages, um, there are things that are inedible for us that you can have pasture animals, sheep, goats, chickens, completely able to eat stuff that we're not able to eat. And then we have the potential to eat them. So, you know, back in primitive times or more ancient times, having the livestock around the farm uh, meant that you were able to really increase the productivity of the area where you were. Um, so, you know, chickens and whatever, and then pigs were even better because pigs ate our garbage. So the stuff that we would throw away that would really, the nutritional value would be lost, it could be turned into pig's flesh. And, you know, if you lived in the more northern climates uh, with the, the, the very cold winters, you need to have an adequate food supply. You need to have uh, food all year round. Um, livestock, again, came in very handy there because you could keep a lot of livestock, usually the non-breeding pair of livestock were around Christmas time. Um, they were used for the Christmas feast. But, you know, it, it made resource management, it made the use of land, it made all sorts of things much better. But in today's agribusiness, it's the agribusiness where it becomes sort of pathological when greed enters the equation. And it's how many animals can we stuff in here and how quickly can we kill them that, you know, certain things, you know, we have to begin thinking about. So, you know, eat meat, eat, uh, you know, the ones that are killed in a more humane fashion that are not raised by agribusiness. And, you know, if you want to keep away, keep away. If your body starts saying no every time you eat meat, you might just have to give it up. You might have to listen to your body. But, you know, fortunately for you, as opposed to me, you can, I used to ruffle feathers every time I saw my mother. She hated the fact that I was a vegetarian and the, the, the stress and strain, which was good in terms of struggle that I caused within my own family, making, you know, and it wasn't, I will eat around it. I don't care. And then they would, no, no, no. And they would go to these elaborate ways of feeding me. And then for the first 13 years of their lives, my children were vegetarian. As soon as they turned 13, I gave them the right to uh, choose what they wanted to eat themselves. Um, so I didn't push it on them. So it's, it's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, the other one about your body. Uh, what have you discovered about the neck? Um, uh, just how many muscles, how many different muscles go through right there. Okay. Um, uh, and even how some of the, the face muscles kind of connect to the... Okay. Um, the neck muscles and yeah, yeah. Um, can you yeah. just put your hands together like this? Just keep get your hands apart and bring them together like this. Okay. Which thumb is on top? The right. Right. So you're right-handed. Some people they think they're right-handed. This is a way of testing. You bring your thumbs together. Um, anything on the right side of your body tends to be, have some kind of a more, more masculine influence. Things on the left side of your body, a more feminine influence. The left side of your body could also be more reflective of your relationship with your mother and potentially children if you have them, but it's more feminine. The right side of the body is more masculine. So the body, um, you know, as a hypnotherapist, do I see symptoms or I, do I see signals? And the signal is that, you know, something's out of alignment here. So your neck, it's on the right side of your neck. So that there is some kind of potential masculine element to the nature of this problem. Why did you hurt yourself on the right side of your neck 
instead of the left side of your neck? Why did you hurt yourself on the right side of your neck as opposed to the right side, say, of your torso or the right side of your rib cage or your right leg? What does the neck represent? Um, the neck represents the ability to look around, the ability to perceive. So um, are you, and an injury, you know, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes an injury is just an injury. Um, is there something related to masculine energy? Something related to that dimension that you just don't want to look at, that you don't want to turn towards, um, or you don't want to pay attention to. Um, the whole body is a metaphor. Uh, this is one of the primary things I go into much greater detail with my clients, particularly if, they're, if they have a specific illness. Um, you know, any illness in the gastrointestinal tract is usually what they call a, a morsel conflict, either having something taken from you or something that's indigestible. Um, movement, muscles, skeleton, they all have a metaphorical meaning. And so every time we do something to ourselves, every time we injure ourselves, anytime we feel an Ill illness, we can ask those deeper questions. So your neck, you know, the neck is responsible for looking around. Um, this side of the neck represents something masculine, perhaps. So you ask yourself, what am I failing to see? What is it that I don't want to look at? What am I missing within my observations? What possible deeper meaning can this have? Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said that we have to join our conscious with our subconscious. And the first time I read that, I thought, this is ridiculous. Or, you know, it's like a flea riding an elephant and thinking it's in control of the elephant. The subconscious is so much bigger. But every act of mindful awareness, for instance, when we bring our awareness to the sensation, excuse me, of air that flows into our lungs and back out again, we are actually harmonizing the subconscious and the conscious mind. Our subconscious mind was fully aware of everything that happened to us, that's happening to us, the sensation of clothing, my breathing, the bottom of my feet, my palms. By becoming mindful of it, by be doing, engaging in these various mindful exercises, particularly self-remembering, we actually harmonize the conscious and the subconscious. Asking yourself questions when you have hurt your body, what is this at the subconscious level? What is my subconscious mind trying to say to me? Now, there is more meaning and more metaphor, say, in long-term illnesses. You know, if you have something wrong with a particular part of your body, you know, if you have some kind of disease or illness and it's been there for a while, to look at the metaphor metaphorical implications is also important bringing the conscious awareness of the, the 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 problem well it means that you can't look around as easily if you can't look around as easily what else does this mean does it mean that you don't want to see things does it mean that there were things you shouldn't have seen you know you can take this you know like sort of this rabbit hole and go deeper and deeper and deeper into it, recognizing that the body is a metaphor for a lot of psychological problems that we have, particularly at the uh, level of emotions and beliefs. Um, this does all, I can relate this all to the Gurdjieff teachings, but you know, it's just the conscious and the subconscious and the way we have to begin paying attention to various things within ourselves. Um, Ian, how are things down in uh, Portland, Oregon? <laughs> um. Things are things are good. Um, still pretty busy. Um, it's funny what what, we, what you've been talking about with the the body as a metaphor. Um, the, the the thing I was going to sort of discuss in my little introduction here is um, I've I've been coming back again and again and again to sensation and to the experience of the body and and you know feeling that and 
as as I get more used to doing that, that experience deepens and there's more information sort of moving, you know, yeah. coming into the body. Um, and I'm realizing how much how much is available there as far as the metaphors of the psychological process or uh, catching emotions when they happen as opposed to <clears throat> taken by them and then dealing with the fallout. Um, I don't have anything major, any major breakthroughs to report, but I'm noticing a trend in that direction that the okay. more often I come back to the body to eat that sort of hmm, more resolution I have to that information. Yeah. Uh, JG Bennett asked Mr. Gurdjieff towards the end of Mr. Gurdjieff's life, what was one of the most interesting things you've learned? And Mr. Gurdjieff's response was sensation deepens. Uh, when you think this man must have been able to sense himself, you know, when he was, you know, a fairly young man and towards the end of his life, it deepens. And it does. It always deepens. Um, something that I've noticed. Now you're noticing it as well. So <laughs> um, when I read that quote, you know, sensation deepens, it was like, yes. Um, and I can only imagine what Mr. Gurdjieff was perceiving through sensation uh, towards the end of his life. Um, and this is so, so important, this physical dimension to bring this energy of attention, of awareness into our physical body, to make our physical embodiment real. Now, the, the other thing um, is that even though the sensation deepens, it's actually a sensation, because you've been doing this a while, it's a sensation more associated with the Kesjian body. Um, you are not just sensing with your physical body, but there's a perception of your sensation that is part Kesjian body now. Um, it's just that every time we sense our body, we leave a tiny crystallization behind. And eventually these crystallizations, you know, one drop from the top of the cave doesn't do anything, two drops, but a thousand drops or 10,000 drops in a stalactite begins to form. You know, the, just becoming aware of our body doesn't do anything. Becoming aware of our body a thousand times doesn't really do anything perhaps a hundred thousand times each each awareness of the body is a tiny crystallization and eventually it gets to a certain resonancy or a certain size and that also has an effect on sensation um, so you are starting to do that you you you, you actually came through um, a Japanese, or not a Japanese, a Buddhist system that really was sensorially based as well, where it focused on that. So you've been working on this for years, and uh, it's a very good observation. Uh, something deeper is happening in terms of sensation. Um, so it's something, it's more vibrant. I mean, if it, it, compared to the old sensation, this is, this is, there's more of an aliveness there. If you pay attention. Mm -hmm. um. One other thing you had asked me last week. Well, after last week's meeting, I mentioned that what we had been talking about was re reminiscent of Plato's cave. Oh, know. yes, yes, yes. And I, about this meeting, so. yeah. Um, I well, I, yeah, yeah, you know Plato better than I do, probably. I've never read Plato. So, or I did read that. I read that way back in like second year university uh, and back then unless it was really mystically inclined it just went in one ear and out the other um, so i didn't really pay attention i didn't understand um, it's about them seeing the projections of people on the walls of the cave basically yeah i mean i've not read about plato but the, the cave allegory i've found and read a few times um the the, the basic story is people are like stuck in a cave i think maybe they're tied up or like you know restrained um and they're watching a shadow play on the wall um projected by and this is back in greece so he was talking about you know torches and people in front of the torches and the shadows up oh, on the okay. wall in front of them. 
And he said, that's how most people spend their lives. But a few of us managed to get out of the cave and go up into the sunlight. And then when the people who have gone into the sunlight come back and try and tell the people in the cave what's out there, they just, they can't. Yeah, they can't understand. Um, so the, the, the shadows against the wall would have been the formatory thinking and the way we normally process things. And that's, uh, that's yeah, that's what I was sort of picking up on last week. Just the, okay. the, the, okay, I've lost your sound. Uh, there, I think you're back again. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm just going to, uh, whoops, uh, whoops, just pull up the, you know, the, the, the reason we're doing this. Um, I work for myself. I work for mankind. I work for the earth herself. The three lines of work. Um, the three levels of man, the three types of man, the man with the real eye, uh, the personally conscious man, and the mechanical man. The man with the conscious eye is myself. The essence, the level of essence is the level of personal consciousness. It's human essence. And that mechanical awareness that we all have, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't be able to function. That machine-like self, that's our self at the level of the planetary realm. And so whenever we work on ourselves, we work on multiple levels at once. Um, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. So let's just try to become aware of our body. Let's just try to become aware of as much of our body at one time as we can. Let's try to be aware of the effect of gravity on our body. Let's try to be aware of the sense of balance within our body. Our head is balanced on our neck, balanced on our shoulders, balanced on our breastbone, our ribs, our spine, balanced on our pelvic bones, balanced on our sitting bones. Try to become aware of the atmospheric, uh, the, 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 the atmospheric air, how it is around you, you know, the, forget the word now. Um, try to sense the atmosphere around you, the, the sensation of the air pushing against you, the atmospheric pressure pushing against you. Then try to become aware of the temperature of the air around you. And then try to focus on your forehead. Try to become aware of the temperature within your forehead and compare it to the temperature of the room outside you. And then move into your body. Become aware of the inside of your head. Become aware of your eyes. Try to perceive, try to sense the inside of your eyes. Become aware of your ears. Try to sense, perceive the inside of your ears. Do the same for your nose. Your nose, your nasal cavity, um, and also your mouth and taste buds. Try to become aware of your eyes, your ears, your nose, your taste buds. Try to become aware of your eyes like orbs sitting in your eye sockets. Become aware of your nasal passage. Become aware of the receptors in your nose that allow you to pick up scent, that allow you to smell. Become aware of your ears. Try to become aware of the little tiny hairs inside your ears. Sensing your ears, sensing the sound that is coming in through your ears. Try to become aware of your mouth, your taste buds, the taste buds in the roof of your mouth, your tongue, the various places in your mouth where the taste buds are. Try to become aware of the taste in your mouth. Try to become aware of the smell in your nose, the sound in your ears, the light in your eyes. 
Try to become aware of your eyes perceiving visual information. Become aware of your eyes receiving light, perhaps color and hue, form and shape. Aware of your eyes receiving this visual information, these visual impressions. And then become aware of your ears. Become aware of your ears perceiving auditory impressions. Aware of sounds, perhaps the sound of my voice or the sound of objects outside or cars or whatever you may hear in the background. Then become aware of your nose, become aware of the scent in the air. Maybe even perceive your own scent or the scent of the room that you're in, perhaps noticing man-made scents, if there's any natural scents around you, perhaps even noticing the direction of any odors. And then become aware of tasting. Become aware of the inside of your mouth. Become aware of the taste buds on the inside of your mouth. We're always tasting something. There's always a taste in our mouth. Uh, it may not be food. You may not have had food. For me right now, I just drank a little bit of coffee a moment ago, so I have a very coffee taste in my mouth. So try to become aware of your eyes perceiving, your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, and your taste buds tasting. Try to become aware of all of these simultaneously. Try to become aware of seeing, hearing, smelling, and tasting all at the same time. Try to hold this awareness as best you can, consciously or with mindful intent, deliberately looking, listening, smelling, tasting. But more than just looking, listening, smelling, tasting, aware of your eyes looking, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, your mouth tasting, aware of these organs of perception within your head receiving information. Aware of your eyes, mindful of your eyes receiving light. Aware of your ears, mindful of the sensation of your ears and aware of your ears receiving sound. Aware of your nose, the inside of your nose, your nasal cavity, the sensation of the inside of your nose, as well as your nose perceiving smells. Aware of your mouth, the taste in your mouth, taste buds in your mouth, your mouth receiving information, perceiving, looking, listening, smelling, tasting, aware as much as you can be of the world around you. And then just allow that to dissolve and just become aware of your body again. Try to become aware of the touch of clothing on your body. Perhaps you have bare feet or socks or shoes. Perhaps you're in long pants and can sense the touch of cloth around your lower legs, your upper legs, around your pelvis, your hips. Perhaps you're wearing a skirt or shorts or whatever. Just try to perceive your lower extremities, your, your, from your waist on down. Try to perceive the touch of cloth the weave of the cloth that touches your body, the sensation of air if any skin is exposed. Then move up to the upper part of your body, your torso. Perhaps become aware of, you know, a shirt or a blouse or a skirt or whatever it is, the cloth in the top part of your body, your upper torso. Become aware of how you can perceive this cloth differently from the front of your torso as opposed to the back of your torso. We actually have less sensory nerve nodes in our lower back than we do anywhere else in our body. So perhaps notice the difference between the sensation of cloth that you can sense in your lower back as opposed, say, to your upper chest. Notice how different these are. Become aware of the sensation of air on your skin on your face, perhaps on your hands. Really try to sense your physical body, becoming aware of all 
four limbs, your arms, your legs, your hands, your feet, your fingers, your toes, becoming aware of your torso, your neck, your head, trying to become as aware of your physical body as you can, trying to sense your physical body here and now in this moment. And then allow that physical awareness just to rest for a moment. And then become aware of what you can see, your eyes seeing, what you can hear, your ears hearing, what you can smell, your nose smelling, what you can taste, your mouth tasting. Try to become aware of one or as many of these as you can in any given moment, preferably all four, with your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, your mouth tasting. And then bring this awareness of your physical body into the process. So you're aware of what you're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, while also sensing your physical body. The head brain perceptions, your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, your taste buds tasting are like the positive end of the battery your body sensing, aware of the sensation of self, that organic awareness of your body as one indivisible whole, that, that full whole awareness of your body at once, while also intentionally and deliberately looking, listening, smelling and tasting, the positive and the negative end, self-remembering. This is intermediate self-remembering. When Mr. Gurdjieff in In Search of the Miraculous is quoted as talking about self-remembering as being needed to help grow our Kesjian body as the first conscious shock, this is what he's meaning. To be aware of your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, your taste buds tasting while sensing your body here and now in this moment, putting this all together, becoming aware of all of this at once or as much of it as you can at once and realizing that this is the goal to build up to this perception and then doing this when you're sitting in a chair or when you walk to the kitchen, or when you go for a walk outside, or when you lie down in your bed, or you sit in a chair, or whatever, to try and do this over and over and over. Every time you do it, you leave a little crystallization behind. And when you do it in the proper form and sequence, to become aware in first position, of what you can see, hear, smell, taste, your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose smelling, your mouth tasting, while in second position, holding in the background that awareness of your body, you are actually growing your being in the proper form and sequence. You're growing your being in a very balanced and harmonious way. And if you want to add just a little coup de gras, just a little bit more, try and become aware of feeling as you're doing all of this. Try and allow perhaps a very simple, soft feeling of joy to rise up along your feeling circuit from perhaps the top of your intestines, through your duodenum, your stomach, your lungs, your heart, your throat, into your face and into your eyes, consciously or with deliberate and mindful intent, aware of your eyes seeing, your ears hearing, your nose tasting, your, t your nose smelling and your taste buds tasting, while your organic sensation, that organic awareness of your body, and perhaps breathing up a tiny feeling of delight. And we can hack the feeling of delight by smiling with our eyes and smiling with our lips and opening to a physical posture that is open to that feeling of joy and delight. And then that this is three-brained self-remembering. This is advanced self-remembering. Work on the two-brained 
and work on the three brain. So just allow your attention to rest now, and I would like you to become aware of your atmosphere. Become aware that you have an atmosphere. Collect your atmosphere. Do not allow it to be dispersed. Pull it towards you. Collect it, perhaps a meter and a meter and a half. Keep your atmosphere in a nice collected state around you. Perhaps you can even become aware of the boundary of your atmosphere. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one up to three. And when I get to three, just breathe your atmosphere in. And as you breathe your atmosphere in, you will also breathe in emanations from this exercise. One, two, three. Breathe your atmosphere in, and then as you exhale, just imagine something remains within you. Imagine that emanations remain and settle within you. And then quietly, in your mind, silently repeat after me. May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just come back. Any observations, any questions, any? Uh, I just wanted to say real quick that um, the uh, exercise that was done, I think it was two weeks ago, where you're going around the limbs and you're breathing in yeah. uh, sensation and then breathing out feeling, um, or what was it? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Is, you breathe in. Know. You breathe in feeling, and then you breathe out sensation. But yes. you breathe into one limb, and then you breathe out the following limb. Exactly. Okay. Um, I've replaced that one with um, just the standard uh, morning exercise that I typically do, and I think um, I, don't know, I think that's my new uh, your new one. Okay. one. That one. That one for me, being able to differentiate from. Uh, Sensation of feeling is um, that's pretty cool. That's um, yeah. my as of right now my morning um, exercise. That's a good one. That's an advanced one. A lot of people have trouble differentiating sensation from feeling, and for a lot of people, it actually takes some years to develop that ability to discern the difference between the two of them. Um, so it's great that you're doing it. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, that's a very that's a one of the more advanced exercises. So uh, um, that I that I go through, there are more advanced exercises, but that's a pretty tough one uh, to do. How long do you do it? Because um, you have to do it. I don't have a recording for that. I do, but you you don't know about it. Um, I just I just pull up the meeting. Oh, okay. Um, two weeks ago, and then just listen to that on that point. Okay, I do have a recording somewhere of it. Um, done a different done slightly different way but uh, if I can dig up that recording I will try and dig it up and link it to this video if I can I, I've got to be able to dig it up I made the recording years ago um, so I'm gonna do something different today um, I actually had thought about what, what am I gonna do today what am I gonna do today and then normally I prepare what I'm gonna do the night before except last night I fell asleep um, so this morning I woke up, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I had been thinking about going through various texts um, related to the Gurdjieff tradition, sort of moving through them. Um, but then this morning I realized I have a lot of quotes. I have like 400,000 words of quotes of the Gurdjieff teachings. And I thought, why don't I just move, you know, some of the quotes are fairly elaborate, uh, some of them aren't, um, but what if I just move through the quotes and discuss these quotes? And for you two gentlemen, if you can think of questions um, for the end of each quote, rather than have to rush and then it's, you know, 11.55 and we've got five minutes for questions to take a more measured approach. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, pull my screen up. Um, and I, this is one of my all-time favorite quotes. It's Fritz Peter's Boyhood with Gurdjieff. 
Um, it's also in a book called My Journey with a Mystic, which is two books uh, combined together. Um, but I love, the, this is one of my, all, as I said, my all-time favorite um, Gurdjieffian quotes. Um, he, George Gurdjieff, speaking to 12-year-old Fritz Peters, went on to say that his work was not only very difficult, but could also be very dangerous for some people. This work not for everyone, he said. For example, if I wish to learn to become a millionaire, necessary to devote all early life to the same and no other. If wish to become priest, philosopher, teacher, or businessman, should not come here. And he's talking about the Institute, should not come here. Here only teach possibility. How become man such as not known in modern times, particularly in Western world. He then asked me to look out of the window and to tell him what I saw. This is 12-year-old Fritz Peters. I said that from that window, all I could see was an oak tree. And what, he asked, was on the oak tree. I told him, acorns. How many acorns? When I replied rather uncertainly that I did not know, he said impatiently, not exactly, not ask that, guess how many. I said that I supposed there were several thousand of them. He agreed and then asked me how many of the acorns would become oak trees. I answered that I supposed only five or six of them would actually develop into trees, if that many. He nodded, perhaps only one, perhaps not even one must learn from nature. Man is also organism. Nature make many acorns, but possibility to become tree exist for only few acorns. Same with man. Many men born, but only few grow. People think this waste, think nature waste, not so. Rest become fertilizer. Go back into earth and create possibility for more acorns, more men. Once in a while, more tree, more real man. Nature always give, but only give possibility. To become real oak or real man must make effort. You understand this? My work, this institute, not for fertilizer, for real man only, but must also understand fertilizer is necessary to nature. Possibility for real tree. Real man also depend just this fertilizer. And after a rather long silence, he continued, in West, your world is belief that man have soul given by God not so, nothing given by God, only nature give, and nature only give possibility for soul, not give soul, must acquire soul through work. But unlike tree, man have many possibilities. As man now exists, he have also possibility grow by accident, grow wrong way. Man can become many things, not just fertilizer, not just real man, can become what you call good or evil, not proper things for man. Real man, not good or evil. Real man, only conscious, only wish to acquire soul for proper development. So if we go and look through this, if you wish to become a millionaire, 
It's necessary to devote all your early life to the same. The same if you want to become a priest, a philosopher, a teacher, or a businessman. Mr. Gurdjieff is doing something completely different. He is recreating a type of human being who hasn't lived in modern times. And if there were just a few representatives back in his day, not in the Western world, the level of being, the level of quality of humanity in the West and in the whole world was of such a low order that there, there were not these kinds of people that he's trying to grow, that he's trying to raise. They haven't existed in a long time. Uh, however, you know, if you decide on something, if you decide early enough in life, you can achieve it. So if you wish to learn to become a millionaire, you must devote all your early life to the acquisition of dollars and money. If you wish to become a priest, a philosopher, a teacher, a businessman, you need to do the same. You need to focus exclusively and put in a lot of hours and determination to acquire the knowledge and information that you need to become those people. But in a sense, if you devote too much time to that, you forego the possibility of becoming a real person, of becoming a man, not a man such as not known in modern times. Then he asked to look out the window and what can I see? Acorns. How many? Um, and I've actually researched this. A fully mature oak tree, about 300 years old, will produce approximately 10,000 acorns each year. And this question, how many do you think will become trees? And, you know, he said five or six of them. Chances are none of the acorns that is produced by a mature acorn tree will become trees. An acorn, you know, an oak forest is a very, very specific type of growth. It doesn't allow for the little plants as the, the oak trees grow big, as they're sort of an oak grove, and they all grow big with the leaves way up there. Uh, it inhibits and it prevents individual acorns from growing around the roots. That's just not possible. In order for any of those acorns in a mature um, oak grove to become an acorn tree, a squirrel would have to take them away somewhere else and bury them and forget about them. Um, the chances of just a, an acorn at the ground below the tree becoming another oak tree is almost non-existent. And this is what he's implying about the ability to grow our being, the ability to become real men. That most of the people that we see, most of the people that we meet, he uses the word fertilizer. Um, so same with man. Many men born, but only few grow. People think this waste, think nature waste, and it's not so. When we go back to the metaphor, to the image of the oak tree, an oak tree, a mature 300-year-old oak tree producing 10,000 acorns in a given season. How many squirrels does that feed? Some of the acorns turn into mush at the bottom of the tree and they get, you know, mushed down. Some of the acorns, the deer come by and feed off them. And the mush gets in turn feeding bacteria and it kind of returns stuff to the soil, which then enhances the growth of the tree. Uh, within nature, nothing goes to waste, not a single acorn goes to waste, becomes fertilizer, it becomes food, it becomes part of the process of nature to create the possibility for more acorns. So 
here he says nature only gives the possibility to humanity. We do not have that by birth. We are, by birth, we're fertilizer. If we want to be anything other than that, such as a real man, we have to do things differently. Nature only gives us the possibility of being fertilizer, not the possibility of being a man. We have to, to develop that. We have to grow ourselves. And here, he said, in West, your world is belief that man have soul given by God. Knowing these teachings as well as I do, um, St. Paul, we can talk about Soma, Psyche, Numa. Uh, these have been alternately translated as body, mind, spirit, or body, soul, spirit. And at the level of Psyche, this is the level of the Kesjian body, where we develop the Kesjian body, which when he is saying the word soul here, um, I believe he's referring to the Kesjian body, so that we're not given the Kesjian body, we're not given that level of psyche. Uh, nothing is given. Nature only gives us the possibility of developing that. But we must hear, he says, acquire soul through work. And by this he means conscious work, intentional, deliberate work. Uh, you know, unlike a tree, man has many possibilities. So we can not only grow a proper way and become what he called an obi obitel, you know, sort of a real good, solid person of the earth. We can grow the wrong way and become many things. And here, um, I like the way he ends this, you know, a real man is not good or is not evil. Um, these are not the proper pursuits of a real man. A real man is only conscious. A real man is someone who only wishes to acquire the soul for their proper development. And good and evil. Um, I've talked about before uh, how in the Old Testament, in, particularly in the Tanakh, the first two-thirds of the Old Testament in the Bible, there are approximately what they call uh, uh, doublets. There are approximately 450 doublets in the Tanakh. And the doublets are the same story from a slightly different perspective. There are two versions of creation, two versions of Noah's Ark, two versions of a lot of stories. For instance, in the Noah's Ark story, in one version, Adam brought every animal on two by two. This is also in the Bible. In the other version, Adam brought on every animal two by two, except the clean animals, that is the animals they ate. And those were brought on seven by seven, seven pairs. Um, two creation stories. There's, you know, God creating the world in seven days. And then there's God creating Adam and then all of creation and at the re end of creation, creating Eve. Those are actually two separate stories. In one, God is given the name Yahweh. And we don't notice this so much in English. In the other, it's um, Elohim. And Yahweh is the God of justice. Elohim is the God of mercy. So anyone who says the God of the Old Testament is not merciful is in a hypnotic state when they re read the Old Testament. He's both just and merciful, except like good and evil. You can't be just while being merciful. And you can't be merciful while being just. If you were just, I'm sorry you committed that sin. You did this. This is the punishment. Mercy mitigates the punishment. So if you were merciful, it's I hear your desire to be forgiven and, you know, your remorse sounds sincere. I'll forgive it. So justice and mercy are incompatible. So any ruler who rules from the perspective of justice or who rules from the perspective of mercy is not a good ruler. In order to be a proper ruler, 
you have to rule somewhere in between justice and mercy. And there may be times you focus a little bit more on the justice and the mercy, and other times a little bit more on the mercy and the, and the justice. But that's what's kind of meant here in terms of good and evil. We do not grow away from evil to good or to evil. We grow between good and evil. And by good and evil, he means the polarities between positive and negative, between the holy affirming and the holy denying, between mercy and justice. So a real man, a real human being doesn't grow at the polarities. He does not grow. She, he does not grow into one of the ends to be good as opposed to evil or evil as opposed to good or merciful as opposed to just or just as opposed to merciful. A real person grows between the polarities, between this positive and negative. Um, any questions, gentlemen? Anything that you want to talk about about this? Uh, I love this quote, one of my favorite quotes. Um, one thing that I liked about it, he talks about the acorns and he talks about the fertilizer and he says, um, the possibility for real man depends just on like is just on this fertilizer um and i think for me that speaks to how important it is like how important compassion is or an understanding or a um sort of a like not looking down on people who are not in the work you know the, the business and the millionaire the priest or whatever that all of that is important um and yeah. not to, you know, not not to try and separate the tree from the fertilizer, so to speak. Yeah, just, uh, just give me one second. I'm going to try and pull something up that I, I like that comment. It can lead to a, a, um, a, a another interesting uh, point of view. Um, can you see this on the screen? No, we, we're not on that screen yet. Yeah. Just give me a second. Um, I just pulled something up to the screen. There we go. Um, the ancient diagram of all living things. I haven't really explained. Um, let me see, can I, how do I get my, um, so everything is divided in three. This higher tri uh, represents what eats us. And this represents what we eat. If you're at 24, if you're a personally conscious individual. So over on the right hand side, I've renamed it and I put the more correct names in. So an awake man is centered in world 12 at the level of the real eye and they eat, whoops, world 48, which is also the realm of slumbering man. Um, so somehow an awake man needs slumbering men and that there's some quality of energy that's produced by slumbering men and also vertebrates, so cows or pigs and whatever. There's some kind of energy that uh, we're able to feast on. And, but what this also means is if you're an awake man, you're eaten and the holy denying, or if you're a mindful man, excuse me, the holy denying, the lowest level of the Godhead somehow feeds on you. That there's this whole process, the upper, or the upper square, you know, as I said, um, we're food for the lower square is what we eat on. So at one point, Mr. Gurdjieff said that man's natural food, and he was talking about natural man, mindful man is 96. And this is the realm of invertebrates. So he actually said our natural food, he didn't say 96. 
He said our natural food would be things like lobsters and locusts and insects to be at that level. That's our natural food for the natural man, but we exist on multiple different levels. So what we eat and what eats us and recognizing how this all plays in. So, you know, uh, people can be fertilizer for other people. They allow people to grow. Um, I mean, this is something really, when you think about it, it just, there, there are so many little rabbit warrens you can go down in terms of how is an awake person feeding on sleeping people? What kind of energy do sleeping people bring to an awakened person that help him to feed? Is it by their nature of being asleep? Do sleeping people, do certain of them approach awakening an awakened person? And in that relationship, there is some kind of feeding. The awakened person perhaps needs groups. He needs students. He needs people coming in and questioning him. And he needs an organization around him because there is this mutual feeding or this feeding that goes on from his perspective to those people who come in. Um, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff has said that, you know, it's not just if I serve you, will I accept you as my student, but if you serve me, if, if, you know, my own personal goals, if you help to support my own personal goals and help me get there, I will let you become my student. This is Mr. Gurdjieff. And you will then learn from me. And there was a mutuality and there was a two-way um, dimension of this. Um, so let me go to the next quote. Um, and for those of you who are watching, you know, um, let me know if this, you like this format or not. Or um, this is a way to just break up the uh, teachings into Nice little morsels. Take a piece of paper and write your aim on it. Make this paper your God. George Gurdjieff, Views from the Real World. Question. I frequently remember my aim, but I do not, but I have not the energy to do what I feel I should do. Answer. This is Mr. Gurji. Man has no energy to fulfill voluntary aims because all of his strength acquired at night during his passive state is used up in negative manifestations. These are his automatic manifestations the opposite of his positive, willed manifestations. For those of you, whoops. For those of you who are already able to remember your aim automatically, but have no strength to do it, sit for a period of at least one hour alone. Make all your muscles relaxed. Allow your associations, the thoughts and pictures that automatically arise in your mind, that is, to proceed, but do not be absorbed by them. Say to them, if you will let me do as I wish now, I shall later grant you your wishes. Look on your associations as if they belonged to someone else. To keep yourself from identifying with them. At the end of an hour, take a piece of paper and write your aim on it. Make this paper your God. Everything else is nothing. Take it out of your pocket and read it constantly, every day. In this way, it becomes part of you. At first, theoretically, later, actually. To gain energy, Practice this exercise of sitting still and making your muscles dead. Only when everything in you is quiet after an hour, make your decision about your aim. 
don't let associations absorb you. To undertake a voluntary aim and to achieve it gives magnetism and the ability to do. So this is all related to the decision exercise. Um, so you need to make the aim, whatever you decide, you make it your God. And here, energy. You know, when we come to the food diagrams, I can just briefly click on them. Each level up is a higher energy. Each level up is twice as vibrant, twice as energetic, twice as intelligent, twice as conscious, twice as aware of the level below. And if you have not conserved the energy within yourself by fixing your leaks, by engaging in self-observation and beginning to repair your human machine, it's very hard to do these things. He's showing a shortcut here. It's not necessarily a shortcut because it requires a great effort. But, you know, rather than going and figuring out the 20 different ways you leak energy to sit for an hour. And he mentioned to sit for an hour and make your muscles grow dead. I like that word, grow, or the word, the phrase, grow dead. But here, notice what he says, that we acquire all of the energy we need to do properly the next day, to be a proper functioning energy station, but we use up a lot of that energy in negative manifestations. These are our automatic manifestations as opposed to the positive willed manifestations. Um, I think it was January the 5th in that meeting I went through I think it was approximately 17, 18 different ways that we use up this energy in a negative way. Unnecessary movements, the people who shake their legs, formatory thinking, that associative thinking that goes on in the mind, churning on and on, all sorts of things, holding unnecessary tension in the body, uh, daydreaming, imagination, internal considering. We waste so much energy doing these things that we do not have uh, sufficient energy conserved to help us to do the inner work. And part of this work is learning and figuring out all those places where we are broken, where we are leaking energy in the negative manifestations and beginning to fix that. But that requires a long period of self-observation, a long period of self-study to begin to know our human machine and to begin to start fixing those negative manifestations so that we have enough energy. Now, this is the shortcut, the decision exercise. So for those of you who have no strength to do it, sit for a period of at least one hour alone and here i have to say as well it's really difficult for a lot of people to sit for a period of one hour alone and it's precisely this difficulty this suffering that will arise when you force yourself to sit for one hour alone that will help you in part to grow some of the substance, some of this energy. This is also a way of really fixing this in your subconscious mind, because to sit quietly for an hour, and so you sit quietly for an hour, and then you make this decision at the end. So you spend that hour, you know, making your muscles dead. And here, you know, he talks about the associations. Last week, we talked about the um, process of the, the formatory apparatus. And the thoughts and pictures that automatically arise in your mind, this is my addition, 
uh, this is the formatory process. This is the whirling of thoughts that automatically proceed in our mind. And here, unlike other spiritual teachers, Mr. Gurdjieff says that the associative mind, the formatory apparatus, it does what it's meant to do. You can't stop it. Instead, rather than being in the active position, you speak to the formatory apparatus, you speak to the associative mind. This part is just naturally going to go on associating, and you ask it if it will accept and move into the passive position so that it's still going on somewhere in the background, but your attention is focused elsewhere. It's not turned off. You're not stilling your mind. You cannot still your mind. These associations will happen. You just have to move them into the passive place so that in the active place, you are focusing on relaxation. Here at the end, look on your associations as though they belonged to someone else to keep yourself from identifying with them. When our associations are active, we're in a state of identification, associative identification, or formatory apparatus identification. When we're just those twirling thoughts in our mind, we're purely in that state of identification. And this is actually one of the main ways we leak energy. So by relaxing ourselves, by focusing on deliberately, consciously relaxing ourselves, and doing this for an hour, not for five minutes, for an hour will involve a tremendous internal struggle. You'll get it, lose it, get it, lose it, get it, lose it. But as you're struggling, you're developing something, you're strengthening something within you. So at the end of an hour, take a piece of paper and write your aim on it. Make this paper your God. Everything else is nothing. So what he's really saying is you only have to sit still for one hour at the beginning of this process. Decide your decision. Decide the decision exercise. Decide what you are going to do. You sit for an hour. Your muscles dead. Yourself in that deep, deep state of relaxation. At the end of the hour, what you've decided in that special state, you write down on a piece of paper, and then you take this piece of paper out of your pocket. Read it constantly, every day. You could even do what they now do tell you to do. Put it on the mirror so that when you walk into the bathroom, you see it. Put it beside your bed so that when you go to bed, you see it. You know, put this piece of paper where you can see it repeatedly. To gain energy, practice this exercise of sitting still and making your muscles dead. Only when everything in you is quiet after an hour, Make your decision about your aim. Don't let associations absorb you. To undertake a voluntary aim and to achieve it gives magnetism and the ability to do. So by sitting, by asking the associative mind to step into the passive role, just to turn away in the background, to bring the relaxation of yourself, the deliberate relaxation of your entire body to get everything quiet, perhaps to engage in one of Mr. Gurdjieff's relaxation exercises, relaxing all 240 muscles as you move down the body, or doing the draining exercise that came through Willem Nyland, just relaxing your whole body so that in this period, in this hour, you're not wasting energy by moving, by fidgeting, by holding tension in your body, and you're not wasting energy by being identified with the associative thoughts flowing in your brain with the formatory apparatus. And from this perspective, you can actually make a decision and decide 
to do something. Now, again, um, try to keep the exercise in alignment with your level of being, wherever that is. It may be hard to determine. Um, if at first, keep it simple. Say that my exercise is going to be reaching for the door handle with my left hand as I walk in the door. Now, he doesn't go into it in this quote, but in other places where he talks about the decision exercise, he also says it's important in that quiet state to think of a punishment. Um, it's also uh, J.G. Bennett said in that quiet state towards the end that you visualize yourself in as sensory rich detail as possible, actually performing that exercise. So if your goal is to self-remember, to imagine that you can self-remember, you know, what would you do? You would be aware of your body, what you saw, what you heard, what you smelled, what you tasted. And to visualize yourself in a sensorily rich detail at the end doing this. So within your sensorily and sensorial mem memory, the, the memory of inside your body. So you're sitting there and you're imagining and remembering what it might be like to walk down the street, fully aware of your body, aware of what you can see, hear, smell, taste. That's very advanced. Or you could just imagine what it's like standing in front of your door, reaching for your keys, putting them in your opposite hand, your left hand, and then using your left hand to unlock the door and then opening the door with your left hand. Um, to visually imagine it at the very end and to set up some kind of a punishment. Something that if you fail to do it, you punish yourself by doing that. And the various points I've talked about holding the arms out at the side of the body for five minutes. That's really difficult. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting uh, exercise. Ian once mentioned that uh, his form of punishment was to have a cold shower. Um, how that just sort of jogged the mind and brought the mind back into it. So this is the essence of the decision exercise. If you really want to begin to become more conscious and you want to start setting yourself will tasks, this is how you set a will task. You make it your God until you achieve it. So I'm just going to uh, stop sharing. We've got a few more minutes left, gentlemen. Any questions on this? Um, it's really the essence of the decision exercise. Um, the importance of consciously deciding on doing something and putting ourselves in that special state, that calm state, deciding, setting a punishment, and then just doing it, perhaps having notes all around your place, a note in your pocket you pull out every day, uh, many times a day. Um, no comments? Okay, um, Brian, are you trying to come? Okay, are you, are you making a comment, Brian? No. You seem to be muted. Ah, there you are. Were you making a comment? I mean, question or? Uh, or you were just yawning? No, I actually, I have some uh, guests here for the weekend and I had to talk to them real quick. Oh, okay. Okay. So I, I thought your mouth, okay, that's why you were. Uh, I, I muted myself so I didn't interrupt. Okay. Ian, do you have any questions? Any comments? No? Not on we've, that one, no. We've gone through that one many times. Um, Sit quietly for an hour. This is, you know, something you want to do regularly. Um, notice the struggle and strain that's required to sit quietly for an hour. Recognizing that as you're struggling, as you're making that effort, you're harvesting a certain quality and quantity of energy. And through doing this task, I like how he finishes with it magnetizes the task. It gives it a certain resonancy, a certain vibrance. Um, so uh, I got quite a few more quotes I can go through today, but I don't have enough time. Um, so I'm going to try this format out for maybe a week or two, three, 
just going through quotes, getting questions, trying to explain them a little bit more. Um, I've got lots of quotes, so I don't have to do the work. I just have to get them and start talking about them, explaining them. Um, if those of you who are watching on Facebook, you like this idea, let me know. Um, if you don't like this idea, if you want me to go back to focusing on some of the big things, which I've done a lot of that already, um, and this will bring all of them back in in a different way, just let me know as well and uh, just take it from here. Um, I mean, the numbers, Karen has uh, said she's getting, you know, it's just becoming more and more inconvenient for her. Angelica's not at home. Uh, Hisham, he's not able to make it today. Uh, Keith said uh, he's dealing with personal issues. And so the, the numbers are kind of dropping a little bit. If anyone else wants to uh, join, I uh, would like to become a member of this uh, uh, Zoom group so that you can ask questions. Just uh, let me know. Um, otherwise, I guess that's it for today. It's almost uh, noon. Uh, thank you very much for being here, gentlemen. And, you know, think of questions and observations and things to start with next week. And uh, everyone, take care. Bye now. Um,